stepping to a reality. If I were to say, I do have a button pusher, and they're not changing, and their drinking bothers me, or their sex addiction bothers me, or their blaming bothers me, or their cold withdrawal bothers me, we might feel bad, and that's a negative thing, but feeling bad and negative things are sometimes very healing and redemptive and good, but it's certainly painful. But we deny that so we don't have to experience associated feelings. I, I know people in, in the dating world who, you know, I've got a friend, she, she used to cut and run every relationship. Every time she'd get in a relationship and something kind of like got screwy in it and she didn't feel comfortable, like, is, you know, because in dating, you got to make sure the person likes you a little more than you like them. <laughs> you ever been there? You just can't feel safe. If you like them better than they like you, you are dead meat. <laughs> so whatever you do, if you like them on a three, they've got to like you on a four or better. Or you are dead because you just can't be hanging out twisting in the wind, right? So you do all kinds of things and make them like you and you kind of hold your cards, you know. And then finally, if they're, oh, they're, they're getting into me. Then you say, I've noticed that you said you would die for me. I'd like to tell you I'm starting to care about you a little bit. It's a huge step. Little cards, big cards. Well, in dating, you know. One of the best things you can do if the person's a reasonable and safe and good person is to say, yeah, I'm kind of into this. But now you're in trouble. Because then I've got a friend who denied that. And she, she kept going from relationship to relationship. And she would only go with guys that totally loved her from date one on. That's how insecure she was. And so what kind of guys did she get? Is this hard? She got guys with no life. They were just looking for somebody that was 98.6. That was their criteria. That was their qual you know, qualification. I love you if you have a pulse. Marry me. High standards. But she felt safe because she had all these guys who were just like, you know, not functioning, but at least she loved them. And then she found a guy she liked, and she really liked him, and he was a good guy. And then she put some cards out, and he went, I, I don't know yet. And she'd never had that experience before. I mean... She did not know what to do because she did value him, but she was like a five and he was like a three and she couldn't find ways. To, you know, she couldn't say, what kind of things do you need for this to be a five? You know, just tell me. <laughs> she couldn't do that. And here she was having to live in the tension of loving and caring about this person. And he's not there. And all of a sudden she started having anxiety and panic and depression, all these horrible feelings. She'd never had them before because she had, she'd been able to deny all these things. When you admit the reality of your button pusher, you're going to have weird feelings. Let them happen. That's God talking to you saying, we've got a problem here. Let's deal with it. Open it up. I'll help you. I'm not, I'm not going to change them at the rate and speed you want, maybe. But the feelings are going to tell you where you are. And they will stretch you emotionally and spiritually. And then spiritualizing. I'm sorry. Sorry. The next one is one time. One time thinking. One time thinking is basically, I should be able to tell this person one time to stop doing that. Or one time to start doing this. Stop doing the bad thing and start doing the good thing. Let's close in prayer. Isn't that wonderful? Why do we do that? You know why we do that, I think? I think it's because we would, I think it's a judgment. Seriously, I think it's a spiritual judgment because we would like a process. We want people to tell us a thousand times, you know, can you like speak softer or can you like uh, come out and relate more? Or can you like um, you know, be with us more? Can you stop being so wishy-washy and tell us a million times because I need reminding and you need reminding. We want a lot of process. We want to give an event. I told you, I don't like it when you do that. I told you at the turn of the century once. Well, if I want a process, if I want the mercy of somebody reminding me, which I do, i got to give it. So stop the one-time thinking and think, you know, it's going to take some reminding. You know, every time I read in the Old Testament, I'm always amazed about how much, and I'm not being negative on God at all, God repeats himself. Have you ever noticed how much he repeats himself? Now, he didn't forget what he said. It's not his way. Why would God repeat himself? Why didn't he just say these things one time? The Bible would be a lot easier to read. It'd be shorter. Why does he repeat himself? Who said that? Not because of him, but because of us. We need to hear it 
over and over and over again in different contexts, in different historical situations, in a parable, in a principle, in a commandment, in a story, in a warning, in an entreaty. We need to hear reality because we're a people who just kind of forget and blow it off and go our way. We are a stubborn-hearted people. Stubborn-headed, hard-hearted, sorry. And so, God, if God repeats himself, get into the game. Just remember, there's a difference between saying something in several different ways and nagging. You don't want to nag, but you do want to say, look, I did remind you of this, and do I need to do this again? I've got a friend who cuts his wife off. I mean, he gets home, and he forgets that she's a person, and he sits there with the TV, and you know, week after week after week, they're dealing with this. And finally, what I had to do with him, he had to write down on a piece of paper, I'm going to talk to my wife when I come home and make two copies. This is how behavioral I had to get. One copy for him and one for me. And so when he comes in the session, I say, have a seat, guys. And I go, okay, how'd you do? And he goes, was that that piece of paper I gave you? Oh, this is going to be a bad week. But he's starting to go, okay, I'm doing it now. I'm, I'm doing the, whatever that talking thing is that you do. And I'm, you know. But I had to have him be reminded because he's a workaholic, great person, good business person, good with money, can't think about relationships. And I'm having to have him accountable to the process by reminding him. And then spiritualizing. Spiritualizing. Now, to be spiritual is a good thing. We're, supposed, we're designed by God to be spiritual beings. And we, in fact, we are spiritual. Um, it's just part of our, our nature to be drawn toward God. That's different than being spiritualizing. Spiritualizing people basically make the mistake of making everything vertical when sometimes it's horizontal. They make everything a God thing when sometimes God says, this is a people thing. I'll give you an example. Well, I've got somebody in my life, and uh, you know he's really, really emotionally uncommunicative. So what'd you do? Well, I told him, you know what? I wonder if you're a Christian. Why? Because you don't communicate with me, and I, you know, Christians should communicate. And there's all of a sudden all this blame and judgment, and, and all of a sudden they're playing their God card because he's the heavyweight. It's like now you got Mike Tyson on your side or something because you're saying the God word. And your butt pusher is just going to feel condemned and judged and beat up. Get out of the spiritualizing thing. Get out of the, you know, I really want you to get your act together or God's going to get you. Um, get out of that. Get into, you know, God's drawn us together. I want God to be the center of who we are. And my heart breaks because you don't connect with me or because you don't listen to me or because you don't attend or because you don't care about my feelings or you only want to talk about yourself or it's hard for you to talk, listen to me when I talk about negative things. I want God to bring us together. Bring God in as the healer, not as the person who's on your side as the big angel who's going to beat them up. Get out of the spiritually, morally superior position. That is the position of judgment and is the problem that the Pharisees had. You don't want to be in that camp. But we do it. But just realize it. Then, there's taking too much responsibility. Taking too much responsibility. You know, all of us, when we've got a button pusher, we sort of go into this crazy... I don't know if you've ever done this. I've done this a million times. We go into this crazy thing between total blame, like, you know, bad weather is the fault of my button pusher. And, you know, bad hair days are the fault of my button pusher. It's all my button pusher's fault. Where we blame everything on them, and then we go the other way where it's all whose fault? It's all my fault. And I, if I just loved them better, and if I took care of them more, and I was more nurturing and understanding, and then they would, they would change. And certainly, you know, you don't want to split here, as I mentioned earlier. Certainly, we do affect people. We do influence people. But you know what? Sooner or later, people have got to account for themselves. Their life is going to account for themselves. I had a friend who was uh, on drugs. He was in his 30s and sort of had a lifetime problem. And I saw his parents go backwards and forth from the, it's all his fault to all our fault. Like within a couple of days, because when you got somebody on drugs, you feel crazy. You feel like, 
I don't know what's up and what's down. They're really nice people, but they didn't. No, nobody ever gave them the skills and the tools they needed. And I remember them. He he used again. He fell off the wagon. And I remember them talking to me and saying, "What did we do? Did we not encourage him enough this week or this month or this year? Or did we did we not like really understand his problems?" And I finally had to say, "Look, you're not perfect parents, and you're on the path, though. I mean, you're the kind of people that listen and you you change and you're you're humble." And I said, Sam is making a choice. He is making a choice to blow you guys off and to do nothing but deal with his appetites and to say it's nobody's fault but yours. He's not telling the truth. And I want you to love him and I want you to be on his side, but realize that Sam has made a choice. And they, you could kind of see the lights coming on like, it's not all about us, no. It's some about us. But the Bible teaches us that sooner or later, everybody's got to answer for their own life. Let your button pusher go. And stop taking all the responsibility for their choices. And when they are you know, hurtful or critical or distant or irresponsible, you know, do the, do the work and say, all right, did I make it easier for them to be that way or harder? And change those things. But ultimately, treat them like a grown-up. Treat them like a person who's got to Take accountability and responsibility for their life. I mean, the cool thing about good psychology and counseling is that it just basically reflects the truths of the Bible. And one of the things the Bible always says is that there's a right and there's a wrong. There's a black, there's a white. There's a lot of grays. There's a lot of mysteries in life that we don't know. A lot of things that we don't understand. But there are rights and wrongs in blacks and whites. And sometimes you have to say, it's wrong what my button pusher did. And I couldn't change it. And I did everything I could. And they chose to walk this way. You know what that does for you? It frees you. Right? It gets you out of jail. So that you stop living for that person and live for yourself and God. Which is a good thing. And also, it frees them from you. It frees them from knowing that you're always over there as the great, you know, net catching them. Some people need to fall off their trapeze and not have a net sometimes. And that's how they grow up. Don't take too much responsibility. The next one is the people that wait. The waiting game. And this is when you've got a button pusher in your life and you figure, well, maybe it's a phase. You know, maybe if I just kind of am impatient, it'll change. And absolutely, I think that there's a lot to be said for patience and waiting. But patience and waiting have to do with a season and have to do with seeing changes inside. Like, is the person listening? Are they getting help? Are they open? Or are they just struggling? That's good patience and waiting. Bad patience and waiting are when you've seen a character problem that has shown no change over time. And you see no movement. You see no interest, and especially you don't see a thing called hunger. You know, I'll go to the mat for a person that's really screwed up but really hungry. And if they come to me and they go, you know, I did this again and I hate it and I just wish I could stop, I'll say, you know, we'll spend all kinds of time on that. But if I've got a person saying, it's not that big a deal, why is everybody so upset? You know, I'd rather have a very struggling, messed up, hungry person than a full person who's really, really looks okay on the outside because they got rottenness on the inside. Don't ever trust that when you don't see the hunger. The, you know, and when you, when, I, when you don't see the hunger, what you see is, I don't really need all this stuff. I'm okay like I am. That's a danger sign. And most of you know that you got close to God and to each other when you finally went, I got problems and I can't solve them by being strong and using willpower and trying harder, then you started getting better. So watch out for the waiting. Don't just wait when you see a character pattern that's pretty consistent over time and you see no hunger. It's not the time to wait. Waiting is also based on a thing that Henry and I um, have written about before in um, our book, uh, I think it was in um, Safe People, called Defensive Hope. When you hope for something based on the fact that you desire it, there's no reality behind the hope. It's just, I want it. 
It's kind of a childlike hope that has no base. It's just an illusion. The Bible talks about real hope. You know, the hope that we have in God and His character is based on reality. So watch out for like, I hope they change because that would be nice. You're, you're skating on thin ice. Um, then reactions. Living uh, in react or reacting. We try to change our button pusher by reacting to them. And that's kind of a defensive game. Like, you, for example, you got somebody in your life who, um, <clears throat> they, maybe you're dating somebody and you care about them, but they just are in and out of the relationship. I mean, they commit and then they back off and then they're dating 20 people and then they commit again. Or, and you just, you, know, you care about them, but it's just not working. And a lot of times the person they're dating will react to them. So if they're nice, they feel good. And if they're distant, they feel bad. And all of a sudden, their, their cart is tied to a, a horse that's out of control. And their emotional states based on how nice that person was to them or how th good things are today. So my good days are based on you. My bad days are based on you. Who's in charge of my life? Me or you? You. It's not a good place to be. The reacting person is in trouble. Uh, and, and this is hard I mean, it's hard to like stop because if you're with a particular type of button pusher that's very erratic and impulsive and, you know, you don't know what they're going to do from one day to the other and they have a history of impulses, you know, sometimes, man, it's just tough because you're trying to play a big, if you're, if you're into basketball, you're trying to play a really big zone defense and you don't know what they're going to do. And so you get really vigilant. All of a sudden, your life is spent trying to do defense against this person instead of a life spent in love with people you care about and cool things you're doing and good tasks and responsibilities and hobbies, all of a sudden you're playing defense. It's like when I go on to the grocery store and I'll see a mom with a three-year-old. Now, a three-year-old, by definition, is out of control. I mean, that's, that's the out-of-control time because now they got legs. You know, when the legs are going, you know, they're mobile. And I'll see these moms basically letting the three-year-old tell them what aisle they're going to go down. And I'm just amazed. Because I know they went in and they wanted, I don't know, produce section. And they're over in the candy section. How did they get there? Because the three-year-old went there. You know, and the mom's saying, come back. Now, that's really effective. Come back, come back, come back. And the three-year-old's like, yeah, right. You know, I don't want produce. I want, you know. And the mom's kind of, and they're sort of embarrassed, like, yeah, I need to get back anyway. Come back, come back. And, and you feel sorry for them, but the, the fact is, who's in charge here? You know, that's why God gave you chiropractor, so you could pick the baby up and sprain your back and go get the help. <laughs> pick the baby up. Or say, you know, no candy till you're 30, or whatever you have to do. <laughs> but I see people in relationships like that. They're following somebody around, and they're, you know, up and down, you know, changes and stuff, and rather than saying, you know, I like this person, they're a relative, or I'm in business with them or whatever, but I'm going to have to be an anchor. I, I've been like rudderless, to use a second nautical metaphor, I've been rudderless too long, I'm going to have to be an anchor here, and I'm going to have to be very stable, and I hope you, you know, change and care about me and become responsible, but until you do, I'm going to be in one place because i got to get kind of grounded here. I don't want to be double-minded. That's two of us then. And then that's, if both of us are double-minded, what's that? Like, that's four minds. You don't want that. What you want is to say, I've got to have a very steady and stable life. And some of us need to do some work on separating from the craziness of our button pusher instead of chasing them down and reacting to their own issues. It just makes them more unstable. And then there's the, I've tried everything. I've tried everything. I've said a million times. How many of you said, well, I've tried everything? Come on, be honest. Well, I suppose in theory, some people have tried everything. But most of the time, I think that that is a, um, a resistance. I think it's a resistance to all several things. It's a resistance to all the work it takes. You know, to have a life over here and to do the right thing with your button pusher over here, that's a lot of work. It's a resistance to doing things more than once. Because most people that say, I've tried everything, what they say is, I tried a bunch of things one time. Like, 
diet pills. You know, well, I tried that herb once. I tried that white plant once. Rather than I went through a systematic you know, study of it and tried it for a long time and got to know it, and then it didn't work after a while. Now, now you know something. You can discard that and go to the next one. Most people have said they tried everything, have really tried several things, and then got discouraged or gave out of resources or figured, what's, it, you know, what's the use? Rather than the reality that God has that person's number. And I'm not trying to sound, you know, negative, like that person is going to, God's going to get that person. But God knows what, what makes them tick. He knows what hurts them. He knows what they love. He knows what he wants from them. He knows what kind of issues they have. He knows what will heal them. He knows what will redeem them. And saying, you know, I don't think I've tried everything. Or if I had tried a few things, I didn't try them deeply and systematically enough. And begin to look to God for the answers because he knows how we tick. And when you do that, things begin to change. And that's what we're going to talk about next session is the resources that we have that help us to be the person with our button pusher that can not cause change because we can't control them, but can certainly can certainly put the right, remember at the beginning of our talk, the right acceptance plus the push. Acceptance and pushing. And everybody has a formula. And it depends on your button pusher of what works. And we're going to talk about that. So, clear the decks. Get rid of all the crazy things. And we'll pick up next session. And I hope that it makes sense that whether you've got a button pusher or not, you do need to clear the decks. But I'm going to close in a prayer now. And I'm going to close in a prayer for all of us that have been um, not sure about where we are with God, who He is, what He stands for. And if you've never made a commitment to Jesus, I would say that if this is the thing that feels right to you and it's a good time, I would do that because it's very simple. That we all miss the mark and sin and that Jesus came for our sins. And all we've got to do is accept Him in our life, in our heart. That's it. It's a simple thing, and it's a good thing. So let's close in prayer. And uh, if you feel that, pray it inside while I'm, while I'm praying. God, um, I just pray that we'll clear the deck and that we'll be open to new ways of dealing with difficult people. And we know that we're a difficult race, and we are your button pushers. And I pray that we'll get ways to bring light and truth to people that really need it. And Father, if any of us have never kind of found out where we are and are centered and grounded on who you are, that will say to you, I know that I've sinned and I've, I've missed the mark. I know that Jesus died for my sins. And right now I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior to forgive those sins. Because, Father, we know that there's no power in the universe that can keep us from walking over that chasm, over that gap, over that canyon of our sin into your waiting arms and your family who are waiting saying, we want to solve that problem, that relationship, that life that hurt, that past, we want to make you whole. And that you do that through the help and the salvation of your son, Jesus. For that in his name. Amen. See you in a couple weeks. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year.